This is, this is a little bit like a Baptist church here. <laughs> this is the Baptists. They're all sitting in the back there. How are you all doing? Good to see you. Thank you all for coming. Nice to see you. Thank you guys for coming. I'm a Baptist. I'm on the front row. There you go. Well done. I grew up going to little independent Baptist churches when I was a kid, and they, you know, little tiny kind of country churches. There was more than 35, 40 people. It must have been like Christmas or something. But everybody always sat near the back, including my family. I don't know why. It's sort of traditional. Let me get mic'd up here so I can move around a little bit. Um, and hopefully. Um, but there's some folks that need these um, mics as well for anything you're recording. You do? Okay. I'll try to tell you what, Ben. I'll just stand here. Why don't I do that? I'm going to take this mic off. I'll just use, I'll stand here. You all can hear me all right in the back? Outstanding. Um, we will use this for those who need it for the microphone. Did you need this one on? To no, no, mic it? Okay. Yep. All right, I'll stand. This is really your time. Uh, thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, we're gonna, we have till, you know, a good hour uh, and, and some change uh, as, as, as is needed understood that if you need to get up and go, please get up and go. Uh, you're not gonna offend anybody, uh, myself or anyone else. If you've got places to go to, thank you for taking the time to be in here at all. So to stay for as much time as you want. We wanna get any and every question you have on any front you have. Uh, the best thing I could ask of you is please don't wait till we're done and then come up and say, hey, you know, I wanted to ask this question, but I didn't want to ask it in front of everybody. Those are the kind of questions we're here to talk about. Whatever question you have, whatever comment you have, uh, if it is a comment, try to make it tight. And if there's a question with it, that's a bonus. Uh, but certainly we have time for all the above. And so uh, let's use this time wisely. I just want to thank you again for being here. I mean, there's a lot of places you could have gone, things you might have done. Uh, on this day. I want to thank our hosts. Thank you for opening this facility to us. Uh, and how about a round of applause, actually, for those who made it up and early to make them. So uh, let's talk about whatever your signs are about. Um, I, it's odd they're all folded up here. Um, they should, you should be proud of them. But let me just say this. Uh, let me just say this. Outstanding. I mean, really. I mean, that's classic. The, uh, as far as, as, far as the, the topic of conversation, um, let it be driven by ideally things that matter, not only in this political cycle, but things that matter economically. I just came from down the road at the 3M plant. Remarkable, how blessed we are to have such an extraordinary uh, employer here in this community. And at the end of the day, when you, let me just back up before, and I'll come to you, Avi, in a moment, but, but when, we, when we look at why we're even doing this, this is the first political job that I've ever had. Some of you are also, how many of you are in a politically elected position or have previously served in some form or fashion? So a number of you, outstanding. So to each of you who have done this, thank you. Because as you know, it's a fairly thankless task uh, to put yourself forward. And at the same time though, it's critical. Because when we think about a government of and by and for the people, uh, this is literally what it looks like. Having this kind of interaction, having the freedom of assembly, having the ability to gather and express ideas, uh, these are the kind of things that, that Americans are blessed to have. Amen. Many, so you think about this, 99, you are a Baptist, I love it, it's awesome, <laughs> good feedback here. But no, seriously, think about this, 99% of the, of the world will never experience the kind of freedoms that we're blessed to have. Not only those who have lived, those living now, or those that will live. And this really is the purpose of all this. Doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. We represent different parties. We represent different ideologies. But at the same time, we sure are blessed to be Americans. I was just out here meeting with some of the folks in law enforcement who were reminded in this community, just down the road, in recent days, just this week, of the sacrifice that people take every single day and night on our behalf to keep us safe. And you think of you know Deputy Morales, who's a, a young man who served this nation in, in, the, in the Marines, you know, put on a uniform, was willing to put his life on the line, came back into the civilian world, putting his life on the line yet again, and has been severely wounded to protect us while most of us were asleep or at least inside our homes, safe and sound. At the end of the day, for all the disagreements that we may have, all the agreements we may have, all the things we think are important, I tell you, I hope we don't forget the things that are truly important. 
and what a government of and by and for the people looks like. It looks like this, and it looks like folks like you and others who have served or are serving. This is what of and by and for the people looks like. So over the course of the next hour and change, let's talk about these things, but why does this matter? Let me just tell you why I jumped into this race in the first place. Why was I even willing to put myself forward? Some of you who've run have an understanding of what it is. You look at what's out there and you say, something needs to be done. My thoughts are X, Y, or Z. I don't feel that X, Y, or Z are being represented the right way. Who's fighting for the people, the voice, the things that need to be done? And so you put yourself forward and the people decide. It's the greatness of America. My passion is, is several fold. If you go back, I would encourage you at some point to Google up and go back and look at when I first ran, I was the only one who ran who actually put out in writing why I was running. And I put out something simple. It was a small document called The Blueprint for a Better Kentucky. There were seven things on it, seven things. They included things like addressing the pension system, education, taxes, regulation. These are the kind of things that have been the topics of discussion during the entire course of this administration. Some have been happy, some have not. But here's the reality, we're wrestling with things and I hope we talk about things over the next hour about things that have been ignored for a very long time, very long time. And we've kicked things down the road and we've closed our eyes and we've pretended that things are good when they're not, and we know it. And we can be upset about the harsh reality that we're now dealing with, or we can be at least willing to be part of finding a path forward. The two primary drivers behind why I ran for office in the first place was number one, the pension crisis, and the fact that it is going to be the absolute demise of this state if we don't get our financial house in order. It's the worst funded pension system in America. It will fail if we don't make structural changes to it. It may fail even if we do, and we can have a frank conversation about that. The other thing was the adoption of foster care system in the state, which has for a long time been very broken as well. And these are just two things where I had a lot of personal experience in, a, in, a, in an understanding of the fact that we could do better. I spent a lot of my life helping states, companies, maintain their defined benefit plans. Helping them to understand that when your liability exceeds your ability to pay it, you run the risk of it failing. I'm also somebody who's adopted four of my nine children tried to adopt a child out of the Kentucky foster care system 10 years ago. And it was such a convoluted bureaucratic mess. I came to appreciate how difficult it was for so many good families to try to find a forever home for the currently 2,500 kids that we have in our foster care system that are fully eligible and desirous of being part of a family. 9,500 kids in our foster care system. Those are the two primary drivers behind why I even got into this race. The other half a dozen things you'll see listed on that blueprint for a better Kentucky. But from the time I got into this position, I've been serious about tackling things that are not politically fun. They're certainly not enjoyable for the people doing them or for the people who are involved in them. I was advised on many fronts, don't ever, heaven forbid, don't talk about the pension plan, don't talk about right to work, don't talk about any of these, these are kind of third rails, don't go there. And yet everybody knew we needed to. And at the end of the day, I would encourage you, whether it's as a governor, whether it's as a state senator or state representative, whether it's a judge executive, whether it's a local magistrate, anybody that you elect at any level, in any role, I would encourage you please to find the men and women that will serve you, shoot straight with you, have a frank conversation with you, even when that is unpleasant or seemingly not politically expedient. You deserve that, you're owed that. The greatness of this state and the continuation of things going forward is dependent on that. Let me stop there, I mean, again, we could talk about any number of things. I'll say one final thing. At the end of the day, what funds all of what we care about? I don't care what you think should be the number one priority for where the state's money go. All the money it funds what you care about. It could be law enforcement, could be education, could be infrastructure, roads and bridges, it could be some combination thereof, it could be something entirely different. 
But whatever you are most passionate about, whatever you think is not getting enough and needs more of the state's resources and attention, is only able to get that if we have money to pay for it. Where does that money come from? Taxpayers. Us, all of us, and, and so many more outside of this room. It's the taxpayers. It's us, which means that everything we want, and why I'm grateful to companies like 3M, as well as all the others, large and small, they're the biggest employer in this county. There's a lot of mom and pop shops that employ two, three, five people. Every single one of them contributes to something which is critical, jobs. Creating jobs, paying taxes. Think about that. Those taxes that are paid, whether it's tens of millions in the case of large employers or, or tens of thousands in the case of small employers or just thousands or even hundreds in the case of smallest employers. All those dollars go into this pot called Kentucky from which we are able to pay for everything that matters to us. And so at the end of the day, it's critical that everything we do has to bear in mind what impact does this have on our ability as a state to create jobs, to have an environment in which people will reinvest. If they're not here, will come to invest, expand, whatever the case might be. Because if relative to another state, especially one that happens to be bordering us, if it's more attractive for them to be there, they will. Why wouldn't they? Any one of us would do the same thing, personally or professionally, if we have a choice. So too do companies. And so we need to be mindful of the fact that we need to be financially solvent. We need to have our house in order. We truly do. Because it is a competition of sorts with other states around us and with us against our own ability to be the best version of ourselves. In the history of Kentucky, the most money we'd ever had invested in our state in private capital in a single year was $5.1 billion, which is a lot for a state our size. Last year, it was $9.2 billion. In the last two and a half years, $16.8 billion. Never in a four-year period have we ever had as much as we've had in the last two and a half. Why do I say this? Because everything we care about, everything, Everything is dependent upon that. Because when those dollars are invested, it's like seeds going in the ground. A whole lot of people in this community who have historically and even now are involved in the agricultural world. So germination is a concept that's not just theoretical to many in this room. You don't just put a seed in the ground and go out the next week and start pulling things out of the ground. It takes time. But this $17 billion that has been put in the ground is in the process of germinating. When it does, it's going into building buildings. And the capital expenditures that go into buildings and equipment, people pay taxes on that. Where do those taxes go for property taxes? They go straight into the school system. Straight into the school system. And so these billions of dollars that are being invested in Kentucky are going to pay dividends. <clears throat> they really are. These are things that are gonna make a profound difference because as those jobs come, and people work those jobs, they're gonna pay taxes. And those monies too will go back. Again, just talking to 3M, and they buy 50 some odd million dollars worth of supplies in Kentucky every year. Think about that. One company buying 54 million dollars a year in, in supplies just from other Kentucky companies? How sweet would it be to have three, five, 10, 15, 100 more companies just like that? So these are, this is why all this matters. It's all interconnected. There's no one thing any one of us cares about that can, can afford to be addressed in isolation. So questions, comments, thoughts, anything? Avi, you had a question. I saw you. Had, I don't know if you did. And then back here. I um, as a reappointed to the board of the Maysville Community College. First, I want to welcome you here also. But wanted to really uh, thank you for your support for the program for the workforce solution for the work ready scholarship. We actually I believe have 425 or so wow. applicants to uh, to the program. It's something that I think the community colleges uh, I know your your appreciation for it. I, I would like to see a lot more done because Unlike the big universities that turn a lot of students with the degrees that can't do anything with it, um, we turn students straight.
straight into the workforce or what is needed or a lot less money. But we've been cut in 2008, uh, I don't remember that, the report. Yeah, it's been 10 plus so years in a row of that reduced cut, funding. Cut, cut, and uh, it's time to put, with all this investment that uh, companies made in the state, we actually will need that. that the bottleneck is going to be the employees. So I want to thank you on that. And unlike all those retirees here, you have to go to work, so I apologize that I have to be very No worries. But thank you for raising this good point. And I and I will, and I'll come to you when there's a gentleman here, and then I'll come to you. But I will simply say this, it is important to think about where we spend the money that the taxpayers generate on education, about priorities. Created a bit of angst among some in post-secondary education that we are moving as a state to outcomes-based funding. That we don't just simply provide funding based exactly proportionally as it has been Based, based in the past. What, what is the, how many people are actually graduating? What is the process and the progress toward graduation? What are the degrees that people are getting and how employable are they? How many of them, upon coming out with degrees, have debt and how much of it do they have and how many of them actually have jobs one and three and five years out? These are things we have to think about. Again, if you're spending your own private money, you can do whatever you want, study whatever you want. But if we're spending the taxpayer's money, then we sure better think about how we're spending it. And we better make sure we're getting a good return on it. That's the whole purpose of using taxpayer money is to better the environment for everybody. So your point is well taken. We are moving more, and I'll come back to this in a moment. I'll take a couple of questions. And if they don't lead to an answer on this front, I'll tell you what my overarching vision is, and it does play very well into this, which is why I'm delighted to hear you have 425 applicants now for this. So here, and then here, and then here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Governor. I'm with Barnett County Judge. I first want to thank you uh, for coming to Harris County and welcome you to Harris County. Uh, to, to open it up to any, any question that's, that's as, 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 as a politician myself, that's, uh, that's, that's great. So, but, I mean, we sure to should be offended if you don't get that. <laughs> well, we sure to appreciate you coming over. And uh, as, as you've alluded to, Harris County is doing well right now. We've got more jobs uh, than we have people. We have people, uh, we have factories that from, from many counties and a, and a long way around. Uh, one of our issues is we, we have a, some people here that probably could work that can't pass a drug test. And we're working very hard to, to do what we can do about that. And hopefully uh, we're, we're making some progress in that area. And But drugs continue to be a problem here in, in our community. And we, we, are, we are taking that head on. But but uh, I've got a fiscal court meeting at noon, so I'm gonna have to go. But no but I just wanted to thank you for coming, coming and visiting with us. Thank You're you. You're welcome. And thanks for what you do in this community as well. Yes, ma'am. My name is Billy Rodman. I've had large jobs. That's right. I'll but, repeat if I'll repeat any questions. Okay. So if I can hear you, I'll make okay. sure I repeat it. I have two frauds to mention. But the first I think I didn't hear you speak about the medical situation in Kentucky. I understand the Affordable Care Act covered 400,000 people and you took us out of the Affordable Care Act. You talked about a Medicare system, but yet right now I have some family members that are poorer than that $700. The medical costs for medicine and everything, when they fall by the wayside, I want to know what your vision is because you didn't mention it, but the national says that's the number one interest of the whole nation right now is health care and you did not talk anything about health care now i'm informed about the teachers club, the pension we cannot operate without schools and teachers i understand that i understand there's a case in the kentucky supreme court i'm asking that you elaborate on that what's sure. going on there and give me an answer what your plan is to cover these people who do not have proper health care Sure, excellent. And I, if you all couldn't hear that, Billy has two questions or two thoughts. One is as it relates to Medicare and, and Medicaid and the provision of, of health care to people, whether they're in either of those categories or just broadly, the people of Kentucky, people who are poor. That was the first. The second was to have more conversation and detailed conversation about uh, Senate Bill 151 and this suit that's in the courts right now. Uh, as it relates to the pension. So let's talk about those in, in that order. Okay. Uh, the, first, the first as it relates to healthcare. 
How many of you, since the, in, in, since the irony of the Affordable Care Act, it did, you made the comment at the outset that it, it, it added a lot of new people to the Medicaid rolls in the state because this was a state that chose to expand its Medicaid population. That is true, it did add a number of people to that role. But here's, and I mean this sincerely, how many people in this room in the last eight years or so since the Affordable Care Act went into effect, coming up on 10 years now, I guess, how many people have seen their health care become more affordable? Anybody? One, two, okay? You have it. I didn't you, have insurance in before. Okay. You didn't have any, no. are you paying for it now? I don't have to because I'm a full-time student okay. and I work, you know, I had three jobs over the summer, so. So it's I'm got, it's gone, you, since you're not paying for it, obviously that's more affordable than if you are, which is understandable. So, you, so right now you do have it, you have Medicaid coverage, okay. Uh, anybody else see their health care coverage go down? Okay, so it's for most people, it's not gotten more affordable. For some, it has. Well, so some, but can you ask if any of these people have seen their health care coverage go up? Yeah, anybody seen, okay, take a turn around. Anybody seen your health care coverage go up in the last 10 years? I paid $1,629 a month for a family of four. Yeah. That's garbage. Yeah, wow. it is. My point is this, we're not in the course of this conversation, nor are we even in a position, if we could solve it, to come up with the answers for how this all balances out. But the bottom line is this, you, Billy makes an interesting uh, point, and that is, this is a big important topic of conversation for a lot of people nationally. People care about this, and why shouldn't they? It affects every one of us. Our health is literally a daily part of everybody's lives. Representative Hart, who covers this area, actually was gonna be here today, but he's with his daughter because he's got an adenoid in, in uh, uh, tonsil issue where it's flared up, so he's had to take her to the doctor. I mean, we don't even know whether it's us personally, our kids, or somebody. This is a very real issue. So the point being, the only reason I ask this question, we want it to be more affordable. I grew, I was one of the people you're talking about. I never had access to health care until I was an active duty army officer in my 20s. I grew up well below the poverty level. My family never had health coverage of any kind. We couldn't afford it. I have scars on my arm that are as thick as my finger. That would have been thin if they'd been stitched up. We couldn't afford to. So you could bat, you know, bandage them the best you could. A lot of people grow up that way. I'm not saying that's desirable. It's not. Of course we would love to have the ability for people to have access to what's needed. No question. So I, I'm not just sympathetic with this issue. I, it's, I'm empathetic, which is a big difference. I've lived there. The first half of my life, I had no access to the very thing we're talking about, which is why it's important that we make sure that it is available, but it has to be able to be paid for because at the end of the day, somebody is paying for your health care. There are many reasons why you're getting it, and that's great. And you are a student, and I appreciate you doing that, because I assume you're studying things that are gonna allow you to ultimately be one of the people who's paying back and helping the people behind you. And so thank you for that. Because truly, this is what we need, is your generation to be seizing the ball and running with it, and because you're gonna hand it off to the people who come behind you. But while you are doing this, and while you are getting this healthcare coverage you did not now have, other people are paying for it. And don't let that get lost because all of it gets paid for by somebody, all of it. I get taxes taken out. I can go print my pay stub off if you'd like to see it too. No, I mean, I, I'm sure you do. I get taxes yeah, if you're working, out. you should be. That's good. That's the way it works. I mean, yeah, that's fine. But I mean, I don't have a problem with helping my neighbor who needs help. Of course not. So. No, I'm, again, I'm, I think we're, we're in agreement. We're, we're saying that's exactly how the system works and that's how it should. But all of this, and we'll come back to the pension in a moment, which is, was your next sentence, next question. All of these things have to be paid for. A point on that, please. A point on that, please. I am governed by Medicare, but I also pay for an additional insurance to cover my expenses and prescriptions and that. And I myself, have to pay to have a prescription that I paid $28 for 
when they put me on there in 1995, the only pill that works with an irregular heartbeat was $28. The only pharmaceutical cares in Kentucky is Walgreens. I have to pay them $440 for 30 pills. That's the cost that's not getting asked about. But coming back, who's paying for underneath the Medicaid and Medicare? It's coming out of Medicare. So I'm paying higher for Medicare and I'm paying for insurance to keep me up above board. And I work 28 years, paid Medicare, paid Social Security. But my interest is what is your plan without Medicare? Medicare this. Two things. First of all, and again, I think you all could hear that question. The question is, what is my uh, thoughts as to how Medicare can cover this? And you ask the level, as is Medicaid, which touches the state and involves some input from the state to a degree. But Medicare, I have zero ability to weigh in on. I mean, it, that is a federal level program that I don't have any ability to, to give, take away, or change at all. That is decided you would need to speak to your uh, U.S. Senators and your U.S. Representatives as it relates to that issue. But understand, Medicaid, some portion comes out of Medicare. Well, and I'll tell you what, the irony is you make a good point. When the Affordable Care Act was implemented by the previous presidential administration, they didn't take hundreds of billions of dollars out of Medicare to uh, expand Medicaid to people like the woman who's sitting right behind you. So you're correct. As, as more people were able to get it, it came from somebody because everything gets paid for. So what you now no longer have, she does have, but someone has it, it's just not you and others like you. And, and that's, so we're paying the extra costs for pharmaceutical, for Medicare, yeah, and for Medicaid. Because everything has to, to be paid for. for someone else. That is correct, and it's not to create angst amongst ourselves, but that is how it works. Because if there's a finite amount of money, if there's a dollar, and there's 50 people who want some, on average, they're gonna get two cents each. You know, if someone has three cents, someone else only has a penny, or maybe nothing, because maybe two people have three cents and someone has none. That's just the way it works. And in a state, and then we'll come to the pension now, because this is very topical and this matters, and what you raise as, as Senate Bill 151 is important. In this state, our greatest threat, our greatest threat is our financial insolvency. If we become financially insolvent, everything else we're talking about and care about becomes a moot point. So let's talk about the pension for a moment. A defined benefit plan by the way in which it's structured came into existence primarily in the 30s and 40s. But in the 1930s, as these plans began to be put into place, a defined benefit plan, I hear people often say, hey, I'm in a defined benefit plan, I paid in, I'm just getting my money back. That's not how a defined benefit plan works. You do pay in, no question. But you're not getting your own money back. Because think about this, the very first people to retire out of a defined benefit plan, did they pay in? No, no of course not. Because that's not how it's designed. And that's not good, bad, or anything. It's just the, re the reality is they didn't need to. Why? Because for everybody up here that was retiring, there were people down here. This is where I need a nice 3M like sticky pad that I can put up here and draw pictures. But think about this, down here at the bottom, there were seven, eight, nine people working for every person retiring. They were down here, they were all paying in. This person up here could afford to retire and these people were paying them. That's the way a defined benefit is designed to work. And it does work as long as baby boomers are being born and not retiring. Demographics have changed. So then it went from seven, eight, nine to four, five, six, still works. Not quite as well, but it works. Three, four, five, a little less, well, two, three, four, it's really not working so much. Two, one and a half, less than one. We now have more retired state workers than we have active workers in Kentucky. That is never going to change. That is not going to ever reverse. Because even now, teachers, who I'm guessing some of you are based on you know t-shirts and signs here. I mean, and I appreciate it, think about this. Even those of you who are retired, 38% of all teachers right now are eligible to retire, 38% of them. So think about this, far more are able to be retired than are coming in, and part of that's driven by the fact that we don't have enough children in Kentucky going to schools to suddenly create an offset to that. If we had a big population surge, then maybe you'd suddenly have a, a, a hiring that would offset that in that one area. But in our state, 
we are not going to ever see more state workers in anything than we now have retirees. So how then does a defined benefit plan work when it's inverted? You now have a person, and I'm just gonna make up a number. Let's just say the person's making $40,000 a year in their state job. The average retiree, I mean, look at teachers. A, a teacher who retires at over 30 years, 30 years or more of teaching. The average teacher in Kentucky who has taught for 30 years or more is taking out $57,000 a year in their retirement. And so if you retired a long ago, you may not be that, but that is the average, right? As of two nights ago, the average teacher who taught for more than 30 years, that's not including the healthcare. That's just the actual paycheck that they're getting in retirement. Now think about this. How is a person who makes, let's say if the average person makes 57 to make the math easy. The average state worker doesn't make that much, but let's say they did. How could a person save for their own retirement out of the 57 Oh, and also live on it, but also pay someone else who's making 57. The only way it would have worked is if enough money had been put aside to make this defined benefit plan work. It wasn't, it wasn't. I'm the only governor in your lifetime that has ever fully funded the pension system, period. I am. Nobody did it and everyone knew it. Everyone knew it wasn't being funded. Where was the outrage then? Where were the people that were upset? Where were the signs? Where were the pickets? I mean, the reality is this, we knew this was coming. We saw what's come. And now, unfortunately, we're stuck with dealing with it. We don't like it. I'm the only one, the only governor you've ever had that has fully funded the pension system. I'm the only governor you've ever had that has not swept the lottery funds, which were supposed to go 100% to education. And not once since that came into existence has that been the case until this administration. Same for CLEP funds, we were talking about law enforcement. The previous governor took $117 million out of the CLEP fund alone, which is supposed to go 100% to law enforcement. $117 million worth of the money that these people that are getting shot on our behalf were not getting, they didn't get a pay increase in their bonus for being POP certified for 21 years until I was elected. Because that money that they should have been getting was going into all sorts of other little pet projects. This is the first administration, you can like it, you can not like it, you can vote for it or not vote for it, agree with it or not agree with it, we're the first administration that actually isn't taking money that was designated for something that was sold to the people as we're gonna do this, that, or the other thing, but the money will go to this. I'm the first person, and this is the first administration that's actually done what we said we would do to the people. I'm also the first person to actually fund these pensions, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna be funded to their entirety. We have the worst funded pension system in America. That's not something to be proud of. And I will also say this, and this is a harsh, and painful thing for us to recognize. There has never in the history of the world, the world, although most defined benefit plans have been in the Western Hemisphere in the last 75 years, but in the history of the world, there has never been a defined benefit plan as poorly funded as ours now is that did not fail, ever, ever. Which means we're not trying to do what they did somewhere else or save it like those people did. Nobody has ever been able to do what we're trying to do. And it may not be possible even here, which is if I'm retired or heaven forbid, if I'm working toward retirement, hoping to retire, that would be causing me a whole lot of angst. I would be very concerned about how poorly funded our pension system is because the odds that your checks will continue to come are increasingly small increasingly small. So Senate Bill 151. Senate Bill 151, which ironically is being, I'm being sued by our Attorney General whose job it is to represent who? You. Both those on the receiving end of a pension, which is a single digit number of Kentuckians, and the 90 something who are paying for it. So think about it. 100% of us are involved in this transaction one way or the other. Whether you're getting a pension or not, you're paying for it or you're receiving it. And the reason the people are receiving it is they provided a good or a service to us that we wanted and needed. Education of our children, protection, roads and bridges, plowing the roads, whatever the case might be. So we're all in this boat together. But here's the reality, there's not enough money to pay for the promises that have been made. 
And part of it is because we have been intentionally lying to ourselves and to folks who've been working for a long time, and people know it. We've allowed people, if you work on average, let's just say, let's just do a quick, when I hear people say, hey, I put the money in, I'm just getting, I'm gonna, I, I have paid the whole. I wasn't one of the first people to retire. I paid in for 30 years. Let's just do a quick mental math problem. Let's say you put in for 30 years. Let's say you make an average, I'm gonna do 50,000 to make the numbers easy. If you didn't make 50,000, you can scale it down. If you made more, scale it up. But let's say you made $50,000 a year on average over your career. You work for 30 years. Let's say you put in 13%, which is a fairly normal amount of money that people put in at the high end. Some put in less than that, but many put in about 13% of their paycheck to their retirement plan. If you put in 13% and you make 50,000, you put in $6,500 a year. If you put in $6,500 a year and you put it in for 30 years, you put in how much? $195,000. And I'm not you know, a math major, so if I'm wrong on these, somebody can correct them. But $195,000 is what you put in over your 30 years. Let's say you started teaching at 25 or you started plowing roads at 25 or you started as a law enforcement officer at 25 or whatever you would do on behalf of the state. You start at 25 and you stop at 55. You work for 30 years. You're now 55 years old. In reality, you probably started at 22 and stopped at 52. Those are more normal to what people have done if they've worked 30 years in the state and started right out of the gate. So let's say you're 52 or 55. The plus or minus. You may not, but many in this room will. So let's say you retire at 52 and you live to be 92. Very reasonable, very possible. Let's say that in retirement, you don't pull out 57,000, even though the average teacher does right now in Kentucky pull out 57,000 plus health care. But let's just say you're a teacher who retired with less than 30, even though that's different than the argument we're using. And let's say the average teacher across the whole makes 37,000. That includes some that didn't even work 25 years. So it say it's 37,000. Let's just say to make the math simple, it's 40 so that we can make this thing easy for us to do in our heads. Let's say you make $40,000 in retirement, not 57, but 40. If you retire at 52 and you live to be 92 and you're making $40,000 a year, that's $1.6 million that you're gonna make in retirement plus healthcare. We're not counting the healthcare costs, although as was noted earlier, it comes at significant cost and increasing. You put in 195 and you take out 1.6. How does that math work? Especially when there's fewer people working than there are retired. It doesn't work. And people say, well, we have to invest it. In what? Where do you get that kind of investment return? You don't. Certainly this state never has. This is the hard reality of it. So truthfully, if I'm retired in this state and I'm getting a pension check, I hope it keeps coming. Because right now, especially if you happen to be the KERS non-hazardous plan, that'll be bankrupt in three to five years. That has hundreds of thousands of people in it. That's the biggest plan we have. But here's what's interesting. I hear people say, well, we're not in that one. We're in the teacher's plan. Or we're in the county employee's retirement system. We're 54% funded or 60% funded. You know what else was 60% funded 10 years ago? The KERS non-hazardous plan. I look at things like the teacher's plan, which is 50 some odd percent funded, three, four, five percent funded. Had a 15% rate of return last year. Ended up with 2% more money in it. What does that tell us? If you can bring in 15%, but you only have 2% more in there at the end of the year, what's happening? We're bleeding out. We're bleeding out. And the trajectory is like this, and the demographics are driving it. The irony is this, they say, well, where is it gonna come from? If people aren't coming in down here, who's gonna pay for it? Guess what, they haven't been paying for it for a long time, as we just talked about. They're not paying for it now. So when I hear people say, we can't end the DB program, or the whole thing, well, the checks will stop coming. They're already not going to come if we depend on people who aren't there. They haven't been there for a long time and they're never gonna be there. The irony is this, Senate Bill 151, that our fearless attorney general is suing to stop, demands of this state, whether we like it or not, 
that we are going to actually fund that, knowing that there's not enough people down here, that we're actually, you're not gonna ignore that, are you? Just, I mean, it just keeps upping the ante of how intense it is. But think about this, we then, the taxpayers, we have to pay for it. Senate Bill 151 says that future legislatures and governors must fund in what's called level dollar funding. So we take the 60 some billion dollars that we owe. And every year for the next 30 years, we put two plus billion in whether we want to or not. We don't get to sweep it and put it somewhere else. We don't get to forget about it and, and ignore it. The previous administration sometimes didn't even put in 50% of the ARC. Not once did they put in the whole ARC. The ARC, which is the actuarially required contribution, is the minimum amount to keep the system from falling farther behind. The minimum amount, not one time did anybody who preceded me ever fund it. This is crazy to me. This again, this is why I ran, is that I love this state. My children love this state. I want my kids and my grandkids to live in this state. I'm not gonna live in this state, nor is anyone else, if it becomes financially insolvent. So if we're gonna try to save it, we have to start shooting straight about what is going on. And this level dollar funding, which is required by law, and if it's struck down, will not be required, says the state has to put billions in to the pension system, whether they want to or not. You can't ignore it. You can't sweep and ignore and fail to underfund. You are required by law to actually fund it. And so it's amazing to me when I have people that are whipped up by the KEA, and I'll tell you, the teachers are not the issue and have never been the issue with anybody. The KEA does not look out for the best interest of teachers or heaven help them, the kids, they don't. They don't. The KEA looks out for itself and the KEA has given so much bad information. And the fact that the KEA would tell you you don't want level dollar funding is remarkable to me. Because if you don't get level dollar funding and you're still working, you're not gonna get a check until you die if you live a full life. You're not, the money won't be there. These systems are the worst funded in America, in America. And the reality is this, we cannot print money. The federal government can, a state cannot. We are required to balance our budget, although people play games with that historically, by sweeping money from lottery funds and cleft funds. That's how they balanced the budget in past years. That's why they swept all those things. We balanced it by being fiscally responsible and everybody hates it. Everybody hates it, you're cutting, you're making cuts to things, of course, because we have to actually pay for what we want and need, but we have to do it with money we actually have. We can only get money as a state from two sources. Three sources, technically, but really two. You either tax people for it or you borrow it. That's it. There's two variations of borrowing. But the reality is one is to just use false assumptions and pretend you don't really owe money, but that's the third and, and very faulty thing, which is how we got into this case with our pension system. But you can borrow it or you can take it from people in the form of higher taxes. Nobody likes either one. And when we have the worst rated credit, there's only two or three states that have worse credit rating than we do. So it's like an individual. If you have a poor credit rating, is a bank gonna lend you money? No, it's the same for a state. We have increasingly limited ability to borrow money. And if in fact somebody's willing to lend us money, it comes at an increasingly high rate of interest because we're a risk. So they're gonna make us pay more. We're on the cusp of being junk status. We're just above junk status as a state. This is not good. This is terrible because guess what? Companies, who wants to be the company that comes and invests billions and builds a brand new 3M type plant if you think the state is gonna collapse financially, who do you think will be left holding the bag? Who do you think will get squeezed? Who do you think is gonna be the easy mark for raising taxes? It's gonna be the people who have a vested interest in a real footprint here. This is a hard, hard thing to think about. Hey, this first. is important. Yes. I have several questions, but uh, Mary Jean first. So Go ahead. Can I make a point? Bro? Taylor, give, let's let her ask a question if we could. My name is Mary Jean Bromper. I'm on the Harrison County School Board, and I'm also an educator. 
Welcome to Cynthia. Thank you. Number one. Home of the Rod Runners. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the Walking Dead. And the Walking Dead. And <laughs> Should we go hopefully, on? Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, number one, book. Kentucky Pride Pensions. Read it? Chris Toe. Yeah. Nobody likes it. The Republicans don't like it. The Democrats don't like it. So what does that tell you? Everyone in this state should read that book. Number one. Number two. I read somewhere that you could sell ice to an Eskimo. And I've just now witnessed that. <laughs> Number three. Here's my concern. The economic policies that you're putting forward. Number one, they depend on parents working. So if parents are going to go to work and they're going to feel that their children are safe, public school transportation is important in that formula. But it's being underfunded. The National Volkswagen Settlement that gives money to our state, that money, according to your energy cabinet, is not being used to replace the buses that we have on the road with high emissions. It's going to be used for other It hasn't even activities. been received. It hasn't been determined where it's going. Exactly. So where's that discussion? Uh, it's not here yet. Well, but we, it should we, be being discussed. It is. Yes. Huh? Well, then it is being discussed. I <laughs> thought you just said it no, wasn't. We haven't got the money. Well, we know we haven't got the money, well, we we but we're planning on it. Number three extended school services being cut dramatically. Do you think that that would help a young parent while they're working know that their children are safe in school and they can be picked up after school at that extended services? But all of that has been cut. So what do you intend to do about that to make the young parents that are working in your workforce that you're so proud of and to make we're sure. All proud of our workforce, yeah, right? we are. are but you? we're not proud of our education system, are we, Dr. Mitz or Bevin? Why not? I don't know. You're the one that makes that decision. No, all I'm, the things I'm, I'm, you have said myself, I'm very stop proud right of there. Don't get into it with us about what you've said. I think you just brought up the topic. No. I yes, I brought actually. up the topic because that is your viewpoint. And that is your decision. And it has been made very clear to all of us how you feel. But I just want to know how we can get our kids to school for the parents and how we can have extended school services, which have been completely underfunded. Can I ask you a question since you, you are a thoughtful person? Um, well, I don't know. We, I'm shaking if, so hard. If we are, you're, doing doing great. you're doing great. If we want to put more money into those areas that certainly could use more money <coughs> that you've just noted, where should we take it from? Private corporations, <laughs> sir. Corporations. Okay, so yeah. 3M that employs 500 and some odd people in this town, they need to pay more taxes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They need to pay more taxes. 3M came in here, used our services, used this city, used the tax level in Kentucky, and have done beautifully. I don't, I don't just deny that. But do they pay the amount of taxes I pay? I don't know. Is the ratio the same? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know those things. All I know is, is I love 3M. We all love 3M. Every corporation in this state needs to be paying more taxes, and you know that. You know what the smallest corporation is? An individual, including that work. Exactly. We're all individual, we're paying taxes. Exactly. And it's interesting, a company like that pays more than $25 million a year in taxes. That's a pretty sizable And amount. what's that percentage and, compared and that's not to what the people What's that, that percentage there? compared to these working people? So let me, so you've raised some They're points. individual too. working people, yeah. the percent from 3M, the percent from, and you're not going to bait me with 3M. I mean, oh, no, I, I mean, they just they happen to be here in town. It's yeah. not a, but, well, let's but, say XYZ company. How's that? It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't sure. matter the company. My point is this. So, so and, and let me let you finish. Do you have other points or questions? Or Eyes to an Eskimo. Okay. Do you want me to answer your questions you sure. raised? 
Do you? Okay. No, I answered in your way. Okay. Would, would you want to answer for me? No, I'm not smart enough to. I think I don't you are. I tell you, you strike me as a person who's quite smart. What it is? What is it that you taught when you taught? Social studies. Social studies. Awesome. And first grade. Outstanding. Well, I, I think pretty much everyone in this room has. And what did your mother teach? She taught to you, Sam. My mother did not. Your okay. grandmother. My grandmother taught math, actually. So, so to your high point, school math, middle high school, school high math. math, high school math. The uh, so for kids who actually, uh, you know, get an education, you, play, you can if you like. It's entirely your call. Uh, here's what I would say: everything has to be paid for by somebody. It does. And when we take a dollar from one place and put it somewhere else, somebody else doesn't have that dollar. So yes, things have been cut. Of course they have, because we're actually paying our bills. We're not pretending the problems don't exist. And the reason, what I could have done, if I wanted to fund school transportation at the same level or higher than it's been before, you know what I wouldn't have done? I wouldn't have put $3 billion into your pension plan last year. That's what I wouldn't have done. The reason these things are getting cut is so that your checks will still come. Are you willing to give up your retirement check so that a student today can get to school in a newer school bus? Are you? Sir, I would sell my soul for the public school system. Okay. So yeah, okay, I good. would. So these are the kind you of things. You ask anybody in this room if I wouldn't, and I would. No, and that's awesome, and I appreciate it. And I hope if there were enough people like you that would say we're willing to make some concessions to our own retirement system in order to fund these other things. But the irony is this, the reason people are demonstrating and protesting is because someone has proposed doing exactly that. That people have proposed the idea of making structural changes, to making some modification, whether it's to a COLA or the ability to use sick days or to, to use a high three or whatever the case might be. And let me explain something to some in this room. It's very familiar to people who've retired. For the state, it may not be familiar to everyone else. There's something called a high three. You get to retire based on your highest three years of earning. No, so, that's not true. Okay. It's five years. Okay, five, well, some, for some people it's five over years. over 55, for then some it's people three it's years. So make sure okay. you tell the truth, I, I sir. Right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Passed them up. Okay, thank you. So for some people, if you don't teach long enough or work long enough, it's your high five. But it's the same scenario, so let me explain how it works. Makes a big difference. If you earn on average $30,000 a year during your 30-year career, but you manage in your last five years or three years to earn fifty or seventy or eighty thousand, which is very possible for people who spent a whole career. You retire based on the highest three or five years of your compensation, but these are the things you also get to include. Vacation days that you accrue, you get to roll those in at the end and count those as compensation, which allows your compensation for one of those one of those three or five years to go up. That increases the cost then, or the value of your income. So you retire for the rest of your life based on your high three or high five, even though you contributed during the course of that based on your actual contributions. Now, is that the fault of the person retiring? No, we've done this in this state for years. Is it actuarially sound or accounted for? No, because the money was never saved up to actually fulfill that. The promises that were made to people about what they could do. Additionally, at some point under the previous administration, we went from high three for those for whom it's three, or high five for those for whom it's five, in the case of three to it's not really 36 months in three years, it's now 25 months. It's the high two years plus your last month times 12. But the previous administration stopped paying people twice in June because they could play games with the budget because the fiscal year ended June 30th. And so you got one paycheck in June and that meant you got three when? In July. When do you suppose the most popular date to retire is? August 1st, why? because you get to take your three paycheck month of July, multiply it times 12, and count that as your last year of compensation. And who's paying for that? The 90 something percent of people that are paying for the state retirement. Plan. And what do you think you got in return? You've gotten for tremendous that things. You've got tremendous things, as we noted before. We've gotten we've got an educated workforce. Of course. And we've gotten proud, for you. we've gotten people in uniform, and we've gotten people who plow the roads. But here's what so we did. So there get. is no comparison. 
Correct, ma'am, but here's what is important to understand. I the promise, Eskimos. That's excellent, but the point is the money, the money actually has to be there. So the promise has been made that you could get these things in retirement, but nobody actually put the money in to pay for it. That's the only point of this. We can be mad at people if we want, but the reality is this. Did you do something in exchange for that? You bet you did for many years. And I'm grateful to you, and I'm sure those whose kids were in your classroom are grateful to you. But somebody has been lying to you for a long, long time about whether or not they could afford to pay what they promised you. <coughs> and you can be mad at me for telling the truth, but it is the truth, the money is not there. That's the only point of this. And so this Senate Bill 151 is an effort to square this up and say we're going to pay the $60 billion back. It has to be paid. Other questions, comments? We can keep I, talking I, about the I, budget. You didn't Here. answer me. You finally didn't answer me. You went on. You said, wait a minute to her. Okay. Now, well, no, but ma'am, in all fairness, there's several other people who've not asked I any questions. I know they are, but you too. said you would answer what we asked. I asked, I answered, uh, we talked about health care, we talked about the pension. But so let you me... didn't answer for future teachers. Where is their future at? And are we going to have an under, uh, lower uh, class teachers that will That's go to another? That's a new question, but, I, but I, I will answer well, that as well. you didn't answer that. What okay. are you doing for the new teachers for their pension? Okay. You didn't answer that. Let me, let me do this. I will come back and answer. I'm going to answer these two gentlemen because they may have to leave. And so in fairness to them, they've had their hands up. I'm going to take their questions and I will come back and answer this question before we're done. Yes, sir. I'm a retired school teacher. Also now working for Falmouth Outlook with Keith Smith. You have a lot of positives you've talked about in your administration, but the rhetoric with teachers, retired teachers, has overshadowed any of the positives in your administration. Do you regret that rhetoric and how it's grown to this level? The things that I've actually said, I don't. The way they've been purported to be said and the things that have come as an outgrowth of that, absolutely. Because I would ask you, give me an example of one of the things that you find to be the most emblematic of what you just said, the type of rhetoric that you think is the, the biggest example. Of. I, I, actually, I had a conversation with a retired teacher this morning. Your comment about unsophisticated teachers in Laurel County is, I mean, I know teachers, I am friends with teachers who you're right that when you start talking about that math aspect of it, they glaze over and they don't like math, but they don't. But that's a comment that is going to be, not be taken appropriately by sure. teachers. And it was a comment politically wise, was not necessarily a good statement to make because of the way it was going to be portrayed and taken. And so are, are those kind of things yeah. that just wasn't the, the best thing to say that you look back at now and say, that was a mistake for me to make. The good thing is we live in a world, just as you're now filming this, so too do people film and, and audio take pretty much everything. So if in fact there was a statement of me making that comment about teachers, it would exist. You, you laugh because you presumably you've heard it, correct? Okay, you've heard it, you say you have. I will give you a thousand dollars in cash, anyone, including you, okay. if you can find the actual audio or videotape of me ever actually making that statement. It was never done. Others said that I said it and everyone believed it. So it goes back to your question. Do I regret the things that I said? Not the things that I said. What others have said I've said and what has come of it, sure, has turned into quite a big snafu in the minds of many. But I'm telling you, if in fact everyone says they heard it, the same thing as it relates to thugs or whatever the case. Everyone's heard it, they say. I'll offer anyone a thousand dollars in cash if you can give me that. No, you should no, be able to Google it up. Just a gamble. No, I'm telling you, no, it's not gambling. It's it's found it's money. It's found money. Yeah. It's only gambling if, if I'm right. If you're right, it's not gambling. It's hundred percent guaranteed. So the reality is this, I didn't say those things. My I have, I'm from three generations of public school teachers. I understand this world well. Last year, as all this was going down and everybody's going crazy, I had more kids in the public school system than the average family in Kentucky. Half of my eight kids that were in school at that time were in the very school system, some of whom were giving us less than 24 hours notice to shut down the school and come and protest, trying to save the very system that people want. I'm very much in the middle of this world. And there are people, the KDA largely among them, who have done a very good job of saying things were said that were not said. 
And again, I've now said publicly, and you filmed it, so you could, whoever you share that with, I'll offer them the same offer. If you can find me stating this about teachers, either of those things or any of these other things, I'll be happy to pony up. I didn't. And so this idea that we have allowed ourselves to get whipped into a frenzy over rhetoric that didn't actually occur has taken our eye off the hard, harsh, brutal reality of the fact that we don't have enough money to make the payments that have been promised to people. We don't. That is a very, very important thing for us to make sure we continue to focus on. We've got to figure out how to pay for the promises that have been made. Well, and nobody previously has been doing that. And I'm one of the retired teachers you talked about. I retired at 51. If I live to my dad's age at 83, I will be a retired and drawing from the pension system about five years longer than I taught. That, that's obviously a system that's not sustainable when people draw retirement salary longer than they actually taught. I this mean, is, just, this is sadly and, true. And, and I mean, I've known this for a long time, yourself and others, we have. Nobody's been willing to address it. And now we're to the point where it is at a crisis. We wish it wasn't. Yes, sir. So my question is this, as you know, I'm like the military. There is no 20 and out anymore like there used to be. Any new recruit coming in, 20 years, you don't draw to your city. Does the state even look at something like that where you can still retire at 25 years, but you won't be able to draw money, and you've got the money you've invested, stays invested, and continues to grow? Been it sure has been, but who's opposed to it? Every the, the question was the question is he said he's a military guy and the military used to allow people to draw a salary when they retired, but now you could serve the however many years that you need to serve to be eligible for retirement. But if you retire prior to the age of sixty two, you don't draw any of it. And so yeah, that's been discussed. And guess who's opposed to it? Everybody who's getting that pension. And they come and they protest, and then who do they scare? They scare the legislators. And then what do the legislators do? They go, well, oh, I guess we won't do that after all. This is only possible if the legislators in this state actually stand firm against the financial uh, untruths that have been told and say we can no longer keep lying to people. We have to actually, you should read the book. I know. Because this is the first administration that's actually addressing it. But here's what I will say. If we don't do things like this, the system will fail. As I said a moment ago, not that we wish it, but we are on a trajectory where the system is not going to survive unless there are what you're describing, they're called structural changes. If there are not structural changes, there is no, here's another thing, COLAs, cost of living adjustments. These are widely debated. Nobody made a contribution to pay for a COLA. Nobody did. They're not actuarially accounted for. They're just a cost of living increase every single year. The 90 some odd percent are paying it for the single digit numbers of people, but the 90 some odd percent don't get COLAs in their retirement system promised to people, but they're not contractually obligated. They're not part of any inviolable contract or anything else. They just feel good. And they help politicians get elected. So everybody went out and said, I'll vote to give you more pay. It's very popular among the people who hear that. But we need legislators that will stand up and do the hard things, which are the kind of things you're describing. So yes, it's been talked about. And in fact, bills have been brought forward that have exactly that in there. And our legislatures, our legislators chose a much easier path. And this is one of the problems that we find ourselves with, is that unless we do the things you're describing, the system will fail. It will fail. Because even if 151 stands, and we make a change only to those coming in, and so it's a good segue back to your question. If it only applies to future employees, it still is not enough to save the system. All we've done now is put a Band-Aid over the hole in the bottom of the bucket. We still have 60 some odd billion dollars worth of money that has to come from somewhere, and every dollar of it is not gonna go into something else that matters to people. So you asked a question, what about the new teachers? Right. What the about those future? The smartest in the body. So we have the best yep. teachers in the United States. The smartest in the body. They will not have no incentive to teach in Kentucky if they have a poor system. To but what, let me ask you this too. What what motivates someone? To, your your comment that the best and the brightest will not teach in Kentucky if they are not incentivized to teach here if with a good retirement system. And they don't have a better feedback. 
for those of you who went into teaching, and I know what the answer is for people in my family, but what is it for those of you that went into teaching, what is it that motivated you? What is it that caused you to go into teaching? In the very beginning, what was it that motivated you to want to be a teacher? A love for knowledge and children. Exactly. It wasn't. It wasn't the pension plan. Correct. We signed no. a contract. Oh, understood. Yeah, but, understood. understood. Right. but the motivator. But don't you think my mother did not lock me up in a corner and tell me how wonderful it was and how wonderful it was going to be? And I believed her, of course, because at that time that's how it was. And to get your masters, oh, and we're not one. doing that anymore. And to get your rank one, because then you will be able to retire with some security, which she did not have. You do understand you can still get your masters and get your rank one. Of course, Mr. Bevan. You can. We understand that. Do you? Yes. Okay. We then, do. So why? But but let's dumb down the teacher no, force. No, no, no. But let me. What, how many? How many of you in your life? If, if if the government came to you and said, "What kind of car do you drive?" Can I ask? What do you drive? What just went brain? A Toyota. A Toyota. Okay. So what if the government came to you and said, "You're not allowed to, to drive a Toyota. You have to drive a Ford." Would you find? Would you be offended at that idea? That you have to be told what to do? Would you? So what arms is this that you're selling? No, I'm just saying, what if, why should you be forced? If you don't want to get your master's degree, why should the state force you to? If you want to get it and Sorry. then get level one certification, you can. You're, nobody's saying you can't do that, but the government isn't forcing you to do it and saying you're not going to be able to be promoted if you don't do it. The government did not force. When teachers went into education, they knew that was part of the plan. But right. you know how many states do that? Yes, we do. You know, how we many, know how, how many, many states, states require their graduate. Their Probably teacher. five or six. And at the time, not even. Right. And at the time, it was not popular. But it you don't isn't. think it didn't make us a better teaching yeah. state? One thing I'll tell a you, better you learning let state? me just tell you in Jefferson County. In Jefferson County. Oh, Oh, you do, Jefferson you know. County. Okay, yeah, it's we'll the largest school that. district in our state. 110,000 students. I know, thank with, you. Uh, and many, many people there with master's level degrees. I know. And a lot of certifications. I know and some of them too, do you? Seven out of 10 black children in that school system cannot read at grade level. Oh, grade level. Seven okay, out of 10. so now I see what we're going no, to do. Is that, is that consider, do you consider that good or maybe something that because we can Because I don't on? believe your statistics. Number one, those are statistics that people want you to believe. There's something. Well, these, are, these were actually put out by the school district itself. Oh, and yeah. seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. Yeah. And so you that, know I, what I would say this. I don't. I. I would say that's not necessarily something we should be proud of. <laughs> and I would think there's room for improvement there. I just. Well, think. of course there's. So the fact that we have people with with degrees and high levels of education teaching to that level of result doesn't then make a correlation between a master's degree and the end result. I'm more interested in the end result. What, about, honest, what about white children in lower economics? It's a very similar demographic if you look at some of our Eastern communities okay. as well. Exactly. exactly. But you're making my point for me. Thank you. No, but let I'm me, not making you really your point for you. No, I'm really not because what was it 50 years ago? When people weren't required they to weren't allowed to go to school 50 years ago yeah. they'd kick them out or they wouldn't have them in school or they'd let them quit when they were 14 or 16. oh my god let's raise the age to 18. okay to so your question about when, what for the people who are not yet teaching i didn't You're, you answered the point that i think most people would say most people and i'll come to you in one minute sir most people in education go into education because they have a heart to teach young people now, that said, that if they could, good. that is true. But to your point, and it's a good one, if you could teach young people and fulfill that desire here for $1 or here for $2, most people would want to do it here for $2. Absolutely. They would, So, which is to the heart of your point. So therefore, what you pay matters. In Kentucky, if you look right now at what we pay people for teaching, and since you asked specifically about teaching, let's focus on that. There are only six states in America that on a cost of living standpoint, adjusted standpoint, pay people more to teach than they do in Kentucky. Only six. We are the seventh highest paid teachers in America. I oh, to now, an again, Eskimo. This is, ma'am, you can, I would just Google it up and you will see these studies have been done time and again, not by anybody in this state. These are by outside groups to look at. 
Because again, while you may make more money in Connecticut or California, your cost of living is so much higher that proportionally, there are only half a dozen states in America that on a per capita, per income standpoint, I should say, pay their teachers more. So, all else being equal, if you're doing it for the love of teaching, and only a half a dozen states in America, including none, I don't believe, that border us, maybe one, but none, I don't believe, that border us, Ohio might be one exception. They might be. If none around us, and only a half a dozen in America, actually offer you more money to do what you love, why would you go somewhere else when you could do it here and do what you love and make as much or more than almost anywhere else you might go? You work because of the cost of living. I myself am not in that bracket, but if I did not have the income I got, I'll move where I can live. Sure. And if they don't have a pension, they're going to be in, in you know, uh, they're going to be uh, for to go, or their life is going to be stable. They're going to be secure when they're my age. Again, so you, the, 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 the part of the question is, if you have a choice between a defined contribution plan and a defined benefit plan, which is the choice that would be offered under Senate Bill 151, they would be required to go into a defined contribution plan, okay? They would be required, law enforcement officers would be the only people that would still be allowed a defined benefit plan if 151 is upheld. So people who are willing to go like Deputy Morales and be shot on our behalf, with all due respect to the rest of us and everything we do, I think are worthy of a slightly different uh, retirement possibility because theirs is a more dangerous job. Doesn't it's mean, more dangerous. So, so my point being, they would, but let me finish, ma'am. If in fact we were to have this bill go into place, only people in hazard duty jobs would still have the possibility of a defined benefit, but they would be given a choice. The actuaries for the JCTA, which is the you know, Jefferson County Public School teachers, their actuary did an analysis and they say that a person who went into a defined contribution plan, 401k type, 403b, a defined contribution plan, and my only option for retirement was the worst funded pension system in America, that's the kind of thing that would make me not want to teach here. It's very different than when your mom stood you in the corner and told you what it was. <coughs> it was that then, it's not now. It's not. No, and so if a person had happened. a choice, if a person had a choice, not only would they make more money, but they would be wise to pursue that path because it affords two things. Number one, better likelihood that you get something back. Number two, it affords flexibility. And a comment was made earlier about the fact that many young people don't want to lock into something for 30 years necessarily. They don't. It's a different world than when many of us were younger. And so young people may want to go somewhere and teach for 8, 10, 12, 14, 18 years and then go and work for a nonprofit or go start a business or go spend time raising their family for a period or whatever the case might be. How awesome if you're able to take and transport everything you earn, especially since what's proposed is the DC plan more money being put in by the state than under the DB plan and it's portable. You can take it anywhere, roll it into your new employer, roll it into a self-directed IRA. You can take it with you. You can work for less than 30 years if you want, less than 25 if you want, less than 15 if you want. And everything you've saved and everything you've put in and the state's put in for you, you can take with you. Frankly, we will have it easier to attract young people. That's the world young people want. It may not be what some of us of a certain age would have chosen, but if I were a young person today, I'm telling you what, I'd want that affordability. I know my nine kids would choose that kind of affordability. Kids who don't want to be nailed down to something for 30 years, they don't. In the back, yes, sir. And do you mind if you come up, because I'm, I'm gonna have trouble hearing you. Just at least come up a little ways. In the last biennium, you put $3.2 billion into the pension system. That's correct. And in a biennium before that, you put over two. Correct. So you say the pension system to fight again another day. We've delayed the demise of the pension system. Some of these teachers are so overcome with gratitude that they're planning to invite you to their house for Thanksgiving dinner because they keep saying they'll remember us in November. Thank <laughs> you. That's a possibility. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, here's the here is the reality. I put more money into this pension system than the previous governor did in eight years. 
But all you're it, concerned about is the rating. Five, five you just that want us to have rate. an A plus plus economic rating. That helps. It needs to be changed, and you know that. What the else? whole tax system. We need a new tax system, and you know that. But, but and that's why that's the elephant in the room. Nobody's yeah. talking about that oh, one. Oh, I've been talking about it for quite some time. Well, I can read my blueprint for Better Kentucky. But here's what we need. We need a broader tax system. Exactly. Let me touch on this briefly. I'll get to both of you gentlemen. We need it. We need a broader tax system where more people are paying less each. But how is that possible? Only if there's more people here. So guess what? We are. You taught the social studies. You said so. I mean, this isn't. You know, borders on geography a little bit. But but you probably in there you looked at the different states and you talked about the history of these and the size of them and how the borders were drawn. If you look at them in proportion of size. Indiana, Tennessee, and Kentucky are all almost the exact same size in terms of land mass. We're literally sequentially three in a row. But not people. We but no. But here's what's interesting. You go back a couple generations, we were much closer. But both we have more we arable land. We have more arable land than either of those states. Certainly more than Tennessee. We have less extreme weather than either. We have more highways, riverways, and roadways that transect through here. We have more logistical hubs than either one of them. So arguably, we should have as much or more ability to have a larger population. And yet each of them have two million more people than we do. We're about four and a half. They're each six to six and a half million people. The answer to your concern and to everyone else's is, could you imagine if we had two million more people here? If we had 2 million more people here and they were just 30 or 40 percent of them paying taxes and yet 600 or 800,000 more people paying taxes every single thing we care about, whether it's a pension, whether it's transportation for schools, whether it's anything else, roads, bridges, law enforcement, all of it is easily paid for. If we have more people here paying taxes, what makes them come and pay taxes? in a free market world where they can go wherever they want. This is not East Berlin. We can't trap them inside. What makes a company that's here expand here? What makes other people want to come here? Lower taxes, not higher taxes. Why do you think Texas- They're coming. Don't why worry, do you they're think, selling plenty of land. Why do Harrison you, County for lower taxes. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. You had a question. I just, I just had a comment. Hey, um, I just want to thank you for, I've heard you speak several times across the state the last couple of years, and I just want to thank you that you are so transparent, that you are so open, that you set yourself up for a situation that most people wouldn't want to be in to take uh, heated questions. So I just want to thank you for, for, for that first and, and foremost. The second thing is that I appreciate the business climate that you have brought to Kentucky and helped in, enhance. As someone that employs folks, we open business in Cynthiana within the last two years and employ eight people, including a retired teacher, and we feel fortunate to get to be in the state that um, that um, you know, has a, a positive business climate. Second thing is that I appreciate your interest in entrepreneurs and folks that want to open business, but I think that that's been ignored oftentimes in the, in the past. And the third thing is I appreciate, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make a fourth. The third and the fourth is I appreciate uh, your interest in workforce development as someone that has started a welding school in another county. Um, I appreciate your interest in that. And then lastly, the fourth thing is, is I appreciate that you're, that you're transparent about your Christian values, that I think that that's something that's just on a personal note that I think that is good for our state and our community. And then I'll close in, in saying this is that I can only imagine how difficult it would be if someone followed me around with a, a camera uh, all the time that they're going to construe some things that I said as something different. And I'm just so appreciative that my wife doesn't take the, the things that I say out of context, that she takes the good things and ignores some of the things that might be taken out of the context. So I can appreciate the situation you're in and thank you for being Cynthia. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to read from my card. Hey, sure. Mr. Benz, my name is Tally Bailey. We've met a few times, and I've talked to you about that I own four person care homes in the state of Kentucky, two in Kings County, two right here in the great city of Cynthiana. Um, one's Parkside Manor, it's a 51 bed facility. 20 of those are wards of the state, and it's mostly a senior citizen facility. And Shade Lawn is a 75 bed facility, 19 are wards of the state, and it's a mid age group. I have them as young as 18 of the 90 bed facility. Most of those suffer with health issues and mental health issues. Um, our current 
per rate is $39.78 a day. $17.10 is about the average of what the state pays in that. Uh, just to put that in respect, Cedar Ridge, your locally, great place, is a private pay. Uh, these jobs should pay no less than 12, in my opinion, which would be a $3 a day increase. And uh, it takes 39,600 hours a year in man hours to operate Shade Lawn. Sorry, I'm shaking. I'm a little nervous of public speaking. And that would be an increase of $118,000 plus working the comp and, and so Social Security tax will also go from that. So I need at least $5 per day raise um, to help me uh, out with that. Uh, the last raise we got from the state was $2, and that was uh, July of 2006. Um, and the only time we ever get a raise is if Social Security or, uh, goes up. And this year was about 40 cents. Last year was a whopping seven cents. Year before that, zero. Um, and just to give you an idea, locally, you know, each resident gets sixty dollars per month spending money, so they spend about ninety thousand dollars here locally. Um, and then my employee salary is about seven hundred forty-six thousand a year between the two. That's been here locally. <laughs> I spend a lot of money at uh, Save a Lot, um, Maysville uh, nursing students. They do their uh, clinicals at Shade Lawn. Um, but I cannot continue to um, do this budget much longer. I mean, I, I, I think I've got a couple of years. Uh, my one facility in King County is a 30 bed facility. I pay no salary there. My wife pays a very minimal salary, which is probably going to end this year. Basically, just volunteers there for their folks, 30 folks. Um, just anything you do to push the cabinet to help out. And uh, it would be a great impact, I think. We could get that $3. We can get it from the inner inner settlement agreement. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. I think it's been a big failure. They got $32 million, which expires this October for those five years. And I, nobody can tell us where that money went. Sadly, there's too many of those things to go. I'm gonna just briefly reiterate what he said. This is a gentleman who operates a number of long-term care facilities. Some are for aged people and some are for people as young as 19 years old. So he's got a couple of facilities here in Cynthiana among the four major ones that he has in this state. The issue he has is in terms of reimbursement that from the state, and there are, there are many forms of reimbursement, some is federal, some is state. Uh, in the state standpoint, you've not seen increases in that since 2006. That's correct. Other than the ones that are passed through as a result of increases from social security related things, yes. uh, which have been fairly nominal in recent years. So the question is what can be done uh, to try to increase the amount that the state contributes to help to offset the cost of actually taking care of some of these vulnerable members of our population? And it's a great question. And it's the very same question, uh, unfortunately, but with a different variation to it as, it, as it is for school transportation, or as it is for you know, new cars for our law enforcement officers, or it is for you know, blacktop on roads that are crumbling. All of it is coming from a finite pot of money. And so your point is well taken, it isn't enough. It isn't. And, you're, and what another thing that he said that I don't know if you heard, and it should be sobering to all of us. He doesn't know how much longer he can continue to operate when he's losing money on a significant number of the people that he actually is providing care for. But he's providing care for people in our community. The truth be told, we're not. Which is why organizations and, com and, and, and businesses like his do. So this is a real issue. You provide a tremendously valuable service just as do teachers, as do law enforcement officers, as do people on our roads, as do social workers. It isn't in any way, shape, or form a, n a lack of recognition for that, but the thing is, there is a finite amount of money in this state. There have been, and you, I hope, are feeling good that you're getting at least some better dialogue with folks in the cabinet, but, but truth be told, the net result of it hasn't seen any change for you. I just don't feel like they're getting truthful with me. You now, who is it now? Just who is it that you've been able to speak with at this point? Uh, Steve Davidson, I believe his name. In in which camps? In in health and family services? Or? Yes. Okay. They're supposed to be rewriting our regs too. Let me do this. When we're done, let me make sure we have your information, and we'll, we'll we can follow up. We won't sure. solve this right now, but we'll yes. follow up with you on this. But your point is well taken. You you are correct. I don't doubt at all. If you if it costs you thirty one dollars a day and you're getting seventeen and change, that's not a long term proposition for staying in business. It isn't. And so I hear you loud and clear. I wish it were unique just to you. As you know, you have many compatriots in the same line of business that are struggling in a similar manner. This is a big problem. 
I mean, you raise the point that there's monies that have come in through various settlements that should have gone to offsetting some of these things, but where has lawsuits and things that the state initiates and that we allow trial lawyers to initiate against your industry. So there are many, many issues at play here. And your point is well taken. This is something that's not lost on me because frankly, this is one of the purposes of government is to take care of the most vulnerable in our society that are unable to care for themselves. And so I'll catch up with you after. I, I mean, again, if I had an unlimited amount of money, we'd fix this like that. We don't because every dollar that would go to that is one less dollar that goes to transportation or one less dollar that goes to law enforcement or one less dollar that patches a pothole. Literally, it is, we, there we is a paid out the general budget. And you know that exactly. And so that general budget is a finite amount of money. It's driven only by how many taxes people pay. That's where the state gets its revenue. That's it. And if we don't have more people paying taxes, we don't have the money. So th your point is well taken. I'll circle around with you after and we'll see what we can do in your specific instance, but but you have a lot of other folks who feel the same way. It's now one o'clock, 105. Uh, some of you have been very patient and staying longer, and I appreciate that. I'm being given the hook we stayed a little longer than we intended to. Um, you know, I, I hope it's appreciated not by all clearly, but but I hope by some. So thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.